Europe, I'm very happy to welcome you to the to our next XDX Data Safe Deep Dive, and this time we are featuring the Data and Nutrition Project. My name is Javier Teran. I work for the Center for Humanitarian Data, and I'm based usually in Geneva. We have prepared a very interesting session for you, where you will learn more about uh, data quality on XDX. This session will be recorded and available soon after the end of this webinar on our YouTube channel of the Center for Humanitarian Data. The chat is open, as I was mentioning before, so don't hesitate to introduce yourself and tell us how you work with XDX. I want to share with you the agenda for today. Um, I will share with you some comments and updates about the Center for Humanitarian Data, also the Humanitarian Data Exchange, and also I will brief you on the work that we do to make sure data on XDX meets the minimum conditions of quality. Then we're gonna jump into introducing the Data and Nutrition Project, and then they will be addressing the research question that we have placed for them, which is how can we prototype quality metrics on data sets hosted on XDX. They have done a, a great research and I want, and we would like to that you hear about their findings. Towards the end of the session, we will have a Q&A. Uh, so prepare your questions and interact with us. Next slide, please. I'm going to introduce our panelists for today's XDX data set deep dive. So to, uh, today we have Kasia Chimlenski, who is the project lead of the Data and Nutrition Project. Maybe Kasia, you can wave your hand. Also today we have Matt Taylor, who is the technology lead also from the Data and Nutrition Project. We have as well Sarah Newman from the DMP and, and Sarah leads the research uh, team. And from the Center for Humanitarian Data, I'm joined by Metasevi Asalu, who is the data manager of the Humanitarian Data Exchange. Next slide, please. Before we start, we go into the research of our, uh, from our colleagues. I just want to uh, give you an update of the work that we're doing on XDX and at the center. This event is prepared and organized for you by the Center for Humanitarian Data. The center, since its opening in 2017, has focused on making, uh, increasing the use and impact of data in humanitarian response. And very important to reach this mission is the management of the humanitarian data exchange, which is XDX. It's an open platform for sharing data across crises and organizations. Next slide, please. As of this week, XDX hosts approximately 21,000 data sets, and the data on the platform is about every active humanitarian organization, uh, humanitarian crisis from Afghanistan to Yemen, with contribution from almost 300 organizations. Uh, actually, we have created two new dedicated pages on XDX for data to support the response to the Morocco earthquake and the Libya floods. So, in case uh, you are responding to this crisis, I really recommend to visit those pages where you can find a lot of very relevant uh, data sets, but also if you are collecting data, don't hesitate to reach out and share it with our community. Uh, Meti will be sharing the links to those two event pages so you can visit them and see the data that we have. In 2022, XDX were used by a little more than 1.5 million people in 233 countries. A little more than 1.8 million data sets were downloaded. And on average, we received between 200 and 220 new or updated data sets every month. In 2024, the humanitarian data exchange will reach its 10th anniversary. And I can not tell you how happy we are uh, of this fantastic journey that we are being we have had together with you to make that they, to make uh, sure that the years to come as as productive as the past 10 years the team has worked on developing the new xdx roadmap that looks into creating opportunities allowing our team but also you as a user to handle data at scale also in the in the months to come and the years to come we want to give more preference to data quality over data quantity on the data sets hosted on the platform. Uh, 
You can learn more about the XDX roadmap in the blog that uh, my colleague Meti is sharing on the on the chat box. Next slide, please. Data is shared on XDX through a series of approved organizations and every new data set that comes to the platform is reviewed by the XDX, XDX team. Data quality is measured against a set of criteria that includes, first and most important, that the data is relevant for our community, for the humanitarian response as well. In addition to that, we make sure that the metadata is complete, that the files that are included for every data set can be open and are also in a machine readable format, and that there is not any personal or sensitive data on the data sets. Next slide, please. When we look into the actual data files, we make sure that we verify the data accuracy, timeline is comparability and, and also the interoperability of the data sets. All this is documented on our quality assurance process that METI will be also sharing on the chat for your information. I just want to finalize just mentioning the generic data assurance quality framework that was developed by the Committee for the Coordination of Statistical Activities. And this is a document that assists every any organization in the development and implementation of their quality assurance framework. This document was based, I mean, the committee work on, on it, looking at uh, influential documents like the OECD quality framework, the European quality dimension framework, but also on our XDX quality framework that we put together in 2014. With this in mind, the research question, I uh, just repeat, that we have given to our colleagues from the Data and Nutrition Project was to investigate how can we prototype quality metrics for the data sets that we have on XDX. With this, I think I pass the floor to Matt. Matt, the floor is yours. Thank you, Javier. Appreciate it. Uh, and thank you all for being here. It's really, uh, it's really awesome to get to sort of talk with you all about the work that we have been able to do with HDX, which has been really wonderful for us. Um, so yeah, I'm Matt Taylor. I'm the technology lead for the Data Nutrition Project here with Kasha Newman. Um, yeah, and next slide. So the Data Nutrition Project formed in 2018 out of a fellowship on the ethics and governance of artificial intelligence. And we wanted to focus when it comes to AI on how AI and statistical systems can be biased and uh, harmful when they are built on incomplete or biased data. So you see some examples in this slide, and I'm sure people have seen a lot of other examples in the news and in other areas recently about how uh, AI systems can make decisions that are systematically biased or systematically isolating certain populations and communities of people. Uh, and a lot of that comes down to the data that's fed into it and that data itself either excluding people or excluding metrics that are important for certain populations within a given decision-making system. Um, so that was what we started and what we wanted to focus on. Uh, next slide. And when we formed, we decided that we wanted to focus specifically on the part of the artificial intelligence and data-driven decision-making pipeline uh, at, the, at the data set formation uh, and, de and decision on how when to use data sets in this pipeline. So really early on, we decided we wanted to figure out how to intervene in this moment between data set choice and data set usage uh, to make sure that when people are choosing data sets to use, when they're building data sets, that they are really interrogating uh, the data quality and ensuring that they are using high quality data that can proactively address potential issues around harm and bias before building their models. Next slide. Um, so over time, we have worked a lot on this kind on this idea of a data set nutrition label. The idea being that in order to interrogate data quality at that point in the pipeline early on, we wanted to uh, use the metaphor of a nutrition label to say like, here is what's in your data. And now that you know what's in the data, what's not in the data, you can make an informed decision about how to use it in data-driven decision-making and in AI modeling. Uh, our first version of this data set nutrition label was really quantitative uh, back in 2018. It had a lot of sort of statistics on distributions across different features within a given data set. Um, 
And when we brought that to some data scientists for feedback, you know, we heard that that's really great. And also like, it'd be really good to know about the process by which data is collected, a little bit more qualitative information. Uh, and this led to us forming version two of our label uh, in 2020, which was very qualitative. Um, and we kind of overcorrected when we got that feedback from data scientists um, when we when we shared it with them again for feedback. And that led us to version three, which you can see at the bottom here, which is sort of a, a socio-technical approach to a label. Um, and, and so where we're at now is that we have this system through which uh, data scientists can create labels for their data sets, which basically capture the process by which data, data was collected, uh, some basic statistical information, and uh, information on the use cases uh, that data can be used for and should be used for, or use cases it shouldn't be used for, and some potential inference risks associated with it. When designing the label, we really wanted to focus on developing a methodology so that the process of creating the label for data set owners was something that encouraged them to think critically about how their data set is structured. Uh, and for people who are then using a label to determine, should I use this data set for a particular purpose or not, we found it really helpful to focus on metaphor, design, and implementation. So when it comes to metaphor, really using that metaphor of the nutrition label to think about what is healthy data and what's not healthy data. Design, making sure that the information about a data set that is most important for that decision making around whether it should be used or whether it shouldn't be used for my particular purpose was really clear and apparent. And any information that you might not know about the context in which a data set is collected, like the social context, uh, was really clear to data scientists who may not have that awareness ahead of time. Uh, next slide. Um, in order to build this label and to iterate over the quantitative and the qualitative and come to the solution that we did, uh, we really found it helpful to have a very interdisciplinary team that has a lot of different types of expertise. You know, we have data scientists, we have former AI engineers, we have researchers, we have designers, we have technologists, uh, all on the team working together to sort of bring in uh, a multiplicity of perspectives to make sure that this is a comprehensive label that people can use. And we like to then use it in partnership with other organizations to think about how this metaphor and this methodology can be helpful in different domains, which leads us to the partnership with HDX. Uh, next slide. So yeah, so we uh, had the opportunity to work with HDX this year. It was really, really exciting for us and really meaningful. Uh, next slide. The, the main purpose of the partnership and the engagement was to think about data quality in the humanitarian data exchange, as you all know, um, you know it's a huge platform. As Javier already said, it's grown so much, and there's so much data present and so much data usage present on this platform. Uh, it is the largest data platform for crisis and organizations. Um, next slide. So, given the evolution of the platform over the last seven or eight years. Uh, the, the purpose of our engagement was to think about, cool, we have all this data and it's going to be used in crisis situations. It's going to be used in emergency situations. It needs to be high quality. We need to make sure that the data can be trusted when someone's taking it and using it in a very immediate circumstance. So how can we take what we have learned at the Data Nutrition Project around ensuring uh, high quality data around what information is necessary for someone making a decision and what information can someone who's building a data set put into a label of some sorts in order to make those decisions uh, as fully as possible and as quickly as possible. And now I will then, oh, next slide. I'll then pass it off to Kasha to talk a little bit about how we approach this collaboration. Uh, thanks, Matt. Hi, everyone. My name is Kasia Shemolinsky. I'm the project lead for the DNP. Um, I'm going to walk through our approach to uh, this work that we've done with HDX and then also some of the challenges we saw, and then I'll pass it on to Newman to continue. So um, our approach really is always uh, very user-centered. We do a lot of research uh, into kind of why we should be building the things that we build and then work with people to actually prototype and see what the impact of, um, of those, those sketches are. So if you go to the next slide, please, we can dive into that. We're really guided by two research questions uh, in this, this particular context. So the first is about uh, better understanding the humanitarian sector. Uh, admittedly, most of us on the team 
haven't had too much experience in this particular sector. We come from industry, we come from education, um, from healthcare, um, but we really wanted to make sure that we were being domain specific and sensitive to the needs of the of the sector. So we wanted to dive into what does high quality data mean within this particular context? Um, and second, how can we then work with HDX to think about what the quality measures might be and uh, try to define and enforce this on the platform, knowing how limited resources are across the board? Next slide, please. Uh, the way that we did this kind of tactically is that we talked to a lot of people. We talked to over a dozen people at the center uh, and also some key data owners who put data onto the platform. We then prototyped a number of quality measures, thinking about, well, what does quality mean in this context and how might we want to present this to users of the platform? And we did this not really just pie in the sky, like what's the possibility here, but then with also trying to ground it into how would we actually build and implement that and scale that. And so this is kind of what we did in, a, in an iterative fashion over the time that we spent together. Next slide, please. We found many fun things, many interesting challenges um, around you know, what it means to be high quality, how to do this on a platform, how to do this as a platform and not necessarily the owner of data. And so we're gonna jump into some of the challenges. I did wanna point out at this, at this moment that uh, there's a blog post that we published with the center last week uh, that goes into a little bit more detail. And there's also a link there to the report that actually has a lot more detail. So if you wanna dive into more of these, which we won't be able to cover in, in total today, um, it's all open and available and we'd love, to, we'd love for you to read it and ask us questions. Um, next slide, please. So the first thing is that we were really trying to understand what data challenges might be unique or especially pertinent in the sector. And um, these are tensions that we've seen in other places too. Um, but they seemed especially pertinent here. So the first is accuracy versus timeliness and this trade-off here. Um, so crises unfold very quickly and data capture is always going to be imperfect, um, often as a consequence, right, of the fact that you're collecting data really rapidly. And so there's this trade-off between a data set being highly accurate and also very timely. The more accurate it is, the more time you put into it, which means the less timely it might be. And that was one very prominent tension that we, that we learned about. The second is the comparability um, of data sets, uh, so being able to compare data sets to each other versus their comprehensiveness. And the idea here is that data that is very, very comprehensive might not follow a particular standard because it's a little bit bespoke to the situation. But that means that you might not be able to compare the data to another data set because they're not following the same standard. Um, and that's another uh, tension that we saw you know, crop up over and over again. Next slide, please. So there were a number of challenges that we identified um, while we were thinking about how to define quality. We, these are, you know, for completeness, these are the ones that we cover in the report. And I think I saw uh, Matty just put the link. So thank you very much for, for pointing to that. Um, in this conversation, I'm just gonna focus on the first and the fifth uh, because we thought it would be interesting for conversation. But again, you can dive into these uh, on your own time if you wanna look at two through four. So number one is identifying scoring methods that are succinct, but not overly simplistic. The idea being that you wanna be able to call out something that is easy to access and is legible, but actually gives you information, enough information to make a choice. And number five is determining who's responsible for what when your data pipeline is quite complicated and you know, the data is switching hands. So who, who actually realistically can be responsible for quality along all those steps? I'm gonna dive really quickly into each one. So if you go to the next slide, please. The first is scoring methods. On the right-hand side, they're just some examples of scoring styles. So you can have scorecards, report cards that look at particular um, elements. You can have an overall score, a summation, or an average, like a GPA, or this kind of fuel estimates uh, you know, graphic here. You can have tiers that just kind of put things into bins or categories and say, this is the lowest tier, this is the highest tier, with a number of different criteria in between. Um, and you can also have these binary badges. So these are all scoring methods that we investigated as part of the research. And the challenge here is that, again, you want to make sure that things are succinct, they're easy to communicate and interpret, but not being overly simplistic, so there's not a lot of information that's actually uh, communicated through that score. Next, please. And finally, uh, determining responsibilities inside the data pipeline. Um, so if you kind of look at the green line there, that's the, the HDX data timeline that goes from data collection to the processing the upload of the data onto the site. And then you know, enabling users to, dis to discover and assess the data and also use the data. 
Um, and if you think of it as a pipeline, it's not always that clear, but if that's generally the pipeline, um, you know, the, the responsibility is probably switching hands at the upload stage. So what are the, the kind of facets of data quality that HDX can actually be responsible for practically and what things are a little bit out of their control? Um, and this was something that we also investigated. I'm going to hand this over now to Newman, who's going to talk about some of our findings. Thank you, Kasha. And hi, everybody. It's nice to be here. Um, and it's been such a pleasure to work with HDX on this project. And while we're talking about some very technical things, which I'm sure you all appreciate, um, I also just wanted to say thank you for all the work that you're doing in the humanitarian sector. Sometimes when we're talking about the numbers and the data and the data quality, we can forget the bigger picture of how important this work is. And so I just wanted to you know, share our gratitude to you all for the work that you are doing and devoting your lives to. Um, so I get the benefit of sharing our findings and some recommendations, which is after all the hard work and um, going through the challenges um, and everything that you heard from Matt and Kasha, I'm gonna share some findings and recommendations and then we're gonna open it up for questions. Next slide, please. So as Kasha did, um, I'm not gonna go through everything, um, but we do point you to the report that Menti just linked, um, but we're gonna share a few in detail and a few more high level. So some of the findings were that HDX as a platform is best positioned to define rather than assess quality. Let me discuss that further in the report. There's an opportunity to, to leverage existing quality measures before just developing new quality measures. Let's see what we already have. Domain experts and third-party validators can provide complementary value. We'll talk more about that. Automation of quality assessment tasks can enable scale. Obviously, everything can't be automated, but if certain things can be automated, that does help. And a primary use case for quality me measurement is data selection, and I'll discuss that more too. Next slide, please. So there's a lot that's already um, collected, and rather than looking to, to find new measures, what's already there? So can we adjust and selectively automate um, existing measures, existing designs and processes that will enable us to build with what we have while thinking about what we want? Um, as you can see on the right, depending on how big your screen is, whether you can read in the table, um, on the left-hand side, there are some things that we included in the quality section, such as use, trust, and safety, and content quality. And those were determined through information that HDX was already collecting in their QA process or elsewhere. Next slide, please. So domain experts and third-party validators have can bring a value, and HDX is, does not sit in the and the center do not sit in the place where they need to necessarily be validating everything. If they can work together with domain experts and third-party validators, that can often complement the data that's being collected. For example, there's knowledge on the ground, especially in um, area, areas of humanitarian crisis. There's often knowledge on the ground that cannot be determined by somebody who's outside of the space and or outside in a different location. And so talking to people that are on site or on the ground who have been working in this region for a long time might bring a type of domain expertise that can complement um, what HDX is trying to collect without HDX being you know, the sole arbiter of, of what counts as quality data. Next slide, please. Another important thing to point out um, that also was a bit of a surprise to us um, is that the primary use case is data selection and comparison. Um, so this would be helped by a, a comparison tool and not necessarily helped by a score. Now, I think many of us are very accustomed to scores, um, whether we're being scored in school or whether we're you know, seeing rankings of various things, um, but a score doesn't tell you what the thing is with respect to. <laughs> and so being able to compare across data sets, especially when you're gonna need to use a data set, um, rather than saying like this one is a five, and Kasha touched on this, whether this one's a five or this is a B plus, um, actually saying like, okay, well, these are the three potential data sets, let me compare them. 
And it's less about scoring them with respect to some somewhat arbitrary denominator, but rather against each other for the, the attributes they have. That was really valuable. And you can see on the right some quotes from people we we interviewed about what they found, um, you know, what they what their viewpoints were about scoring versus comparison. Next slide, please. And last, we're going to leave you with some recommendations. Uh, next slide. So the designs that we offered, and this is phase one, so we have three phases. Um, phase one, what we first offered is a feature set that adapts our label for, the hum for humanitarian data set contents and usage, leveraging the information that HDX already collects. So you can see on the left-hand side, the window to the HDX platform. And on the right-hand side, you can see, well, on the left-hand side, at the very bottom, you can see like a little tab that says quality measures. On the right-hand side, that's a, a view of that tab. And you can see the way we broke it down was into use, trust and safety, content quality, and tech specs. This is a hopefully legible, slightly modified version of the information we would collect for a normal data set nutrition label that's customized for the humanitarian domain and using the content that HDX already collects. Again, this is for phase one. One thing I'll point out here that's, that's we important in our, and Matt, Matt talked about this too, um, in our label and something that we carry over here is having this use section very well highlighted. So the intended use of the data set, other known uses of the data set, restrictions on use of the data set, and then things that should not be used for. And we think this information is important to provide in all cases of data sets so that they're used as best as they can be and also how they were intended. Or if they're used as they're not intended to make sure that it's not um, violating any restrictions on use or potentially creating any harm. Next slide, please. So upcoming um, phase two slash three, um, since it's a future um, future phase, some things we would like to, to do and the things we recommend are the ability to um, compare and contrast. So a view that will surface, that will programmatically surface other similar data sets. So what you see here on the left-hand side would, would kind of could show up at the bottom underneath the data set you're viewing. And based on some of the metadata that's in the system, it could pull these other data sets. And there are certain ways in which um, they're similar, there are certain ways in which they're different. Um, they have more information. You know, we have things that are, have more information around use or content quality in green, things that are have less information in red, but you can say, oh, let me look at these because there might be something valuable about these. And, um, and then the right-hand view is a search result. So you can see like a, if you were searching for a certain data set, you could see several show up. Um, with some of the important metadata kind of collapsed into a view where you can look at them together. Next slide, please. So our broader recommendations here are to consider quality for what purpose? What behavior or tasks will higher quality enable? What information can you provide that enables meaningful user choice? In other words, quality it needs to be with respect to something and it's res with respect to a purpose. So we should be considering quality with respect to what purpose. And very importantly, I already touched on this, but what do you already know? How can you surface that information as a starting point? So whether you all are working with HDX, with other repositories, with your own data, and you're thinking about trying to leverage some quality standards, um, let's see what, what, see what you have there and start, start with that. And quality can be more than a score um, and often includes information that is already captured and understood but may not be readily shared. Next slide. And with that, we are going to open it up for questions and thanks everybody for being here and again for all the work you do and thanks to HGX for having us. Great. Thank you so much, um, our panelists, for, your, for sharing your insights uh, on this important topic. Uh, we can now transition to the Q&A session. Um, our audience, the chat box is open for your questions. So please continue to send through your questions and we'll do our best to cover as many as possible within the time that we have left. 
Um, maybe to get us started, um, I have here a couple of questions. Um, and I'm sure many people in the audience would like to hear more on the process behind creating the data set uh, nutrition levels and who is involved in what way. Uh, for instance, people might be wondering as a data owner or a subject matter expert, how they can um, you know, uh, contribute and what their roles are. So maybe if you could, um, we could start with that. Over. Kick it off, and then if folks want to jump in, Matt and Newman. Um, yeah, so the question of how, how you actually create this label, um, we have built the process and the tool in such a way that we are really optimizing for someone who knows a lot about the data set to build the label. You can think of it as kind of better, uh, deeper data set documentation that's standardized. And usually you have documentation that's built by the person who knows a lot about it because there's so much that goes into the documentation that you can't see in the data. It doesn't mean that you couldn't find a data set and build a label for it without full knowledge of how it was constructed. But a lot of what we do focus on is kind of the qualitative information of why things ended up the way they did. So if you work with data, you know there's a lot of decisions you're making along the way. You're saying, all right, you know, I have a bunch of null responses. If it's survey data, what am I going to do with that? Is that going to be a zero? Is it going to be a null? Am I just going to remove it? Am I going to fill that in with something, maybe the average? And so we try to understand, um, we, have to, we ask a lot of questions about the collection and then the processing and cleaning of the data and also um, the publishing of it. And we try to surface that in the label. So the first thing is that we try to work with the data set owners or people who are very familiar with the data. The second is that it's mostly like a survey. You can actually play with this yourself. It's publicly available. It's just label maker, one word, labelmaker.datanutrition.org. Um, or you could probably just Google data nutrition project and it will come up. Um, thank you, Matt, for throwing it in the chat. Um, and uh, you can just go there and create a new label and start filling it in. We ask you about 50, maybe a few more questions uh, that follows that process there. And then this, this uh, this question about subject matter expertise is actually you know, very important for us. We wanna make sure that if we are going to validate the label, um, that people are involved who are subject matter experts in the content of the label and how that, sorry, the content of the data and how that data may or may not be used or something uh, familiar about the domain. Um, so right now, if you submit a label, it comes up as a draft and you can do that with no problem at all, it's completely open. If you want that draft to turn, turn into a validated label, that actually then goes through this process where we engage with subject matter experts to take a look at that and um, give us opinions on that so that we can determine uh, that it is kind of what it seems. Um, admittedly, that process is fairly new. Um, you know, We're still trying to figure out how to make sure to involve all the right people and how to make sure that people see value of that process, um, You know, trying to avoid it becoming an extractive process essentially. I guess I'll, I'll pause there and see if either Matt or Newman wants to add anything to that. I think that's great. And I see a lot of more, a lot of good questions coming in. So that's terrific, Kasha, thanks. Great. Um, yeah, so I, it's a collaborative uh, process, I believe um, is the, the underlining word. And maybe um, in your experience, uh, what was, uh, the difference um, when you are looking at the humanitarian data versus other uh, types of uh, data um, that you have labeled and does your methodology apply to all data or um, is it to some better than others if you could just share uh, some more uh, information on that I'm, i can jump into that one um, thanks so Let's see, our, I would say our methodology does apply better to some contexts than to others. Our, I guess with, with respect to humanitarian data, some of the things um, that I already mentioned, but I'll underscore include, um, well, and we actually, several of us mentioned this, like the timeliness of the data. So, you know, you can't have both um, infinite time to perfect something, but also have it in time for what you're trying to do. So I think especially in the humanitarian context, like we're often saying in tech, we say don't move fast and break things, move slowly and be cautious. And I think there's a lot of domains in which one can take the time they need to get something right. And, you know, our instinct is slow down, slow down, 
to double check, triple check the data. Um, in the humanitarian context, as you all know, that is often not an option. Not a, you, you know, you don't have like the good fortune of being able to take all the time you want. You are, it, it is a crisis that is very time sensitive and you have to work with the best data that you have at the time, or you have to collect data in a way that isn't, um, I mean, you all know this better than I do, but to collect in a way that would be different than if you were doing it like in a scientific lab and you were designing the process exactly how you wanted it. So I think that was one um, main difference is being like seeing the, the whole ecosystem of, of, you know, where the data is coming from, but also what it's being used for as interconnected and not preventing, not saying you have to slow them, something down enough or we're gonna like judge this as being bad data again, because the context is really different in which it's collected. Um, I would say that was pretty eye-opening for us in terms of like some of our natural instincts for like always aspiring for be to better quality. It's like, we don't wanna have less data out there. And I think there's some questions in the chat that touch on this too. Like we don't wanna de-incentivize people from collecting data or publishing data because, because it's gonna be imperfect. And this is actually one of the reasons that we also were steering away from scoring a little bit because we want people to be incentivized to collect metadata, to publish data, um, to share data, but to do so responsibly, of course. Um, so that would be um, on the first part. The second part, I would say, and I'm curious if Matt and Kasha have other thoughts, is in terms of how it applies, how our methodology applies to all data, um, unstructured data can be a little bit more challenging, or you know, a lot of people are thinking about generative artificial intelligence and large language models. We haven't made labels. I mean, there's certain types of data, I think, at a certain level of scale that is would you know need to be we would need to build out our methodology a little bit more to take into account some things that are not um, represented currently but i would say within sort of mid mid-sized data sets or you know mid to large even to extra large size data sets and certainly for small data sets our methodology works pretty well um, domains who are realizing including the humanitarian domain there's an opportunity to learn something further about the domain and customize the label accordingly I'm curious if Kasha and Matt have other thoughts on that. Great. Hey, uh, I resonate with everything you said. Oh, sorry, Kasha, do you want to go? Oh, I think I missed a gesture. Okay. Um, I uh, so yeah, I, I totally resonate with with everything Newman said, and I think the the only things that I would sort of add on is that you know, the way that we try and have the the label apply across a, a large swath of different types of data is through having lots of questions that focus on the process by which data was defined and then collected. And kind of to Newman's point around it, not really applying to everything. Um, you know, as we've learned more, we've learned that that process, it might not be exactly the same uh, and might not have all the same heuristics across domains. And so as we are you know, we are definitely interested in and trying to um, engage with data experts across large types of domains to understand how in the future we might be able to um, customize the label or branch questions based on specific domains and what works for them versus for others. Great. Um, there are quite a number of questions coming from the audience, um, and I would like to start address, uh, I mean, bringing them to, to you. Uh, to get to answer them. So one question which I um, have here from Kamal Ahmed from Netherlands Red Cross. Um, the question is, um, why is there no feedback loop considered at the user side to help improve uh, data quality? And it's a uh, uh, question also related to that uh, coming from Hussein. Um, so asking when somebody download a set of data and find some um, mistakes while using it, what's the approach to motivate these people to report um, back and provide the feedback? So it's just more about um, is there a way to incorporate feedback and uh, over time improve the, the quality of data and, and how you look into that in this framework? Over to you. I'll jump in if I remember correctly, and then my colleagues can correct me if I don't remember correctly. Um, we definitely talked about kind of user generated um, quality assessment or feedback uh, as part of the process. I think that looking at the statistics um, on the HDX platform, you know, we have some data sets that are um, accessed a lot, and there's, a, there's kind of a, a long tail. 
Um, and so I, th I think that we had decided that the best time to do an, at least an initial quality assessment is when the data is uh, uploaded onto the site. So you kind of have that initial gate of quality and then you're doing your assessment there, which is already what's happening with the HDX team. And so we really focused our attention on how can we start from where we are and kind of iterate out in order to make this immediately implementable and scalable. And I think the social features, if I remember correctly, we definitely thought that it would be interesting to get people's feedback, especially around the use cases and the known uses. Um, and I think that just ended up being part of the phase three or beyond. Um, so the, the thing I do want to point out about the use cases, I, there was a mock-up that Newman flashed up that had kind of the four quadrant um, same kind of a design borrowed from our nutrition label that had use cases, you know, what it's supposed to be used for, restrictions on usage, things you shouldn't use it for, and also known uses. And so I think that bucket known use, um, meaning, you know, these are examples of how this data has been used before. Um, that was definitely a place where we talked about crowdsourcing or getting some feedback from people to surface how the data had actually been used um, uh, kind of in the world or in research or in the media, these kinds of things. So there were definitely components of that. I think it was more of a, this seems like a, a farther out feature considering we're starting from where the platform is today. Um, but certainly we think there's a value in, in kind of the knowledge of the commons, right? Kind of like the public knowledge or kind of user knowledge of people who have actually gotten into the data and tried to use it for themselves. Um, I, I think maybe Matt or Newman, if there's anything else that I've forgotten there, please jump in. That was great. I guess one, one thing I'll just add um, is that we really care about feedback, um, you know, sometimes to a fault, I think, as Matt showed earlier, not to a fault. I mean, it's really important, but user feedback is why we've had three different label designs of the data set nutrition label in five years, because we keep saying, like, how is this working? What could be better about it? Is this serving your needs? And then we go back to a redesign process. So I wouldn't recommend you know, creating a product and then fully redesigning it every 18 months. <laughs> but we do, uh, you know, the sl that particular um, slide didn't show that full feedback loop, but that is something we think is pretty much of top importance, like something being useful and to the, to, to the audience, you know, that we're designing for. Great. Thank you for that. Um, so there's this um, question coming from Steve uh, Penson. Um, is there, do you have any recommendations for contexts where data may be influenced by authorities which may impact the data quality and therefore the decision making? And what would your suggestions be to improve data quality and improve uh, accountability for data quality in this uh, context? Um, maybe over to you. Uh, well, I don't know if any of us, I mean, on the team have, this is a really, I should say, we get, we do a lot of talks. These are maybe the best questions I think we've ever gotten in a talk and also some of the hardest, um, which, which I really appreciate. Um, yeah, I will, um, I, I'm happy yeah, to, to, go ahead, go ahead, yeah. Matt. I'm just gonna say, I don't know <laughs> if I have a good answer to this question. Um, but what, yeah, but I, could, I could take a guess, but Matt, you go ahead and then I'll, and then I'll go. It's, um, I remember this kind of came up for me actually for the first time in our HDX in um, sort of collaboration. And it was one of the first time that I learned about sort of the, the data, the data that defines borders uh, between, between states, between counties, between provinces, between countries, and how that has to be very specific and how everyone might not agree on uh, and different authorities might not agree on which specific aspects. And I was, that was the first time that I was sort of like, uh, like, like really started to think about that. So kind of similar to Newman, I would say, um, I'm not sure if we have a very specific answer at this particular moment. Um, we uh, like working with HDX has been really helpful for us to learn about the humanitarian domain. And this tends to not come up as much in um, in some of the other sort of like tech domains that we have worked in so far, uh, it may come up a little bit in uh, some of the more regulated fields like healthcare um, and financial technology. Um, however, usually when that comes up, it's around privacy, it's around access to personal data, and that authorities are kind of defining what you can and cannot, uh, or saying what is and what isn't. Um, and so 
I feel like that is a little bit different than authority saying like, this is the data versus the data that you might have had that's different. Um, so I think it is definitely an open question. That's my very long winded way of saying it's an open question that we ha don't have an answer to. <laughs> I, one thanks yeah thank you Matt uh, one thing I would um one thing I would say is that knowing how other people have used the data can be one indicator so you know bad actors are a problem of their own and that's like you know pretty hard to deal with but where we have known uses the more a data set's been used by others and that's reported and shared back that can give you a sense I mean we're trying to encourage transparency um, but if you have bad actors or authorities that are impacting data quality. There's only so much you can do, but if you know a data set has been used to certain ends and used well, and you're trying to talk to people who have used the data set and include that as part of your transparency mechanism, then there's something like some, there's sort of proxies for tr trustworthiness that can surface when you see that a data set has been used by a bunch of your colleagues in, and you, you know, and, and to good end. And that doesn't mean it's perfect. And that doesn't mean there wasn't a little bit of influence there. But if you see this like iffy data set that you've never heard of and are just put out by a government um, and everything looks perfect, like maybe that's not the best, you know, the best one. So I think that there are some proxies, but again, you all have the expertise in the humanitarian data. You probably have better knowledge about um, how to evaluate that. Kasha, maybe you have something to add. Yeah, I would say, um that really a lot of what we were doing was thinking about proxies for trust and how you build different notions of trust within this platform. So some of the designs that we had were kind of getting to some of this, some of the designs that Newman showed, one being the role of subject matter experts and third party certifications. So where you know a data contributor will upload data onto the site, HDX does, the kind of quality check that it can, maybe a technical quality check or something like that, make sure that it's using P codes and you know using Hexel and you know doing something that's kind of standardized from a technical perspective on the site makes it comparable. Um, but then there might be a subject matter or a domain review, and we were highlighting the opportunity for third parties who are really experts in that domain, so experts in that country or in that system or in you know that area. Um, to come in and offer kind of third party certifications or to take a look and review that data in partnership with HDX. So this is not happening. I think it's happening in some very small ways, but it's not happening yet as a program to the best of my knowledge. Um, but there'd be an opportunity for that kind of thing. So if you were seeing a data set that looked a little suspect and you had experts who were um, really well versed in what it should look like, that's a great place to leverage the wisdom of those experts to help to identify quality issues. And then the other part that I kind of just mentioned is the comparability. So if you have multiple data sets, you make it very, very easy to compare data sets, either the same kind of data year over year or the same data from two different sources or three different sources, and you make it visually easy and legible and accessible to compare those data sets. You can also start to surface as a user the discrepancies between them, which is another way, I think, to identify when something's been messed with, right? Or someone is giving you data that is um, very imperfect or very biased, because we know that all data is imperfect and all data is biased. Um, and that, I think, is another mechanism or a tool that you can give people to make better data set selection choices. And these are all kind of proxies um, for getting at untrustworthy data and for um, supplying or providing user choice. Um, I don't think we have like a silver bullet in terms of, oh, this is going to be the you know, the binary, like thumbs up, thumbs down. This was provided by an authoritarian government and it's a lie or not. Um, I think that is really hard, but the more mechanisms you put in place that allow people to get transparency into what's there and leverage the wisdom of subject matter experts, I think the closer you can get to understanding the situation. Yeah. No, thank you so much, Kasha. I think that that is very useful um, insight, and I'm sure many of us are benefiting from that. Um, maybe uh, just to uh, raise a few more questions uh, coming from the audience, and I'm this time I'm asking the question come from Nadine Levin. There's a quite a number of questions um, they've shared. Uh, maybe the first one is what uh, 3P vendors would you suggest specifically for data quality assurance? And they also uh, mentioned their um, experience um, as uh, saying they were, that they are facing the exact issue um, and um, regarding the trade-off between accuracy uh, with, uh, the, with timeliness. 
um, and their field experience is mainly in Syria and Af Afghanistan, uh, where you know priorities are there. There are urgent priorities, urgent tasks. Um, so in this in this type of context, and um, considering the the trade off, uh, the challenge um, striking uh, a balance between accuracy and timeliness. What specific recommendations uh, do you have regarding uh, this um, uh, when it comes to data pipeline improvement? Um, uh, and yeah, just if you could elaborate on that. I can probably, before one of my brilliant colleagues takes a second run, just mention to Javier that I think that <laughs> you probably have to answer the first. <laughs> but now I'll let Newman and Matt jump in on the second one. I would say, I mean, oh, sorry, Javier, you go ahead. Sure, absolutely. So um, just making sure which one you want me to answer, the one of the three-party vendors or, or the problems of priorities on the field. Maybe maybe I take that one. And, um, and exactly, we understand that uh, there are so many um, constraints or caveats that there are when data is collected. And one of the things that we always suggest to the organization that they share data on XDX is to provide this type of information on the metadata. The metadata has always been saying is one of the most important parts of a data set. So if you are collecting data, which is the case now in Syria or Afghanistan, and you have issues of accessibility, or you didn't have enough time to validate the data, please do add that on the metadata component. So we have a part in the comments where you can always add what are the challenges, the constraints, the potential bias or the potential uh, issues that your data set may, may have. So that so, so far has been very useful and the community appreciate that very, very well. Um, in terms of how we're gonna implement this one, I mean, this is still a work in progress. We wanna still working with the DNP to see how we can make it um, practical and user friendly. And that is, I, I, don't, I don't have a, a, a date for that. But, um, but certainly we'll be communicating that with all our community and with our users. Uh, Kasha, over to you, maybe with the, the rest of the questions. Yeah, I mean, I think for the, for the so for the third party question and which organizations, I, I think that that's squarely out of DNP's wheelhouse uh, in terms of assessing and if which organizations are the experts in various domains. But I think the types of organizations would be, say, geographically focused or subject matter focused. So if they're really focused on education data, or they're really focused on, um, you know, the, the CODs or kind of these these kind of operational data sets. If, if there are people or organizations that are who, who are very, very focused on that one type of data or that domain, um, I think that's the kind of expertise that makes sense to think about bringing in or partnering with. And we didn't have like a list of um, organizations that we recommended, for example, because it's not it's not our expertise to identify which organizations are the best. But those are the types of those are the types of organizations that we would be thinking about. Folks who are really deeply in one area. Um, and to the second question, I mean, I just second what Javier said and, and thinking about metadata structures that allow people to surface that kind of information. So if you made a data set very quickly and you know that you um, weren't able to survey everybody or some of the surveys um, blew away in the wind or whatever, it was, and you know there's some constraints, um, how are you building your metadata for each data set that gets entered or uploaded to capture that information, that critical information, so people understand the limitations of the data? And it doesn't mean the data doesn't go onto the platform. It just means that there are kind of caveats and there are tips for people who are using the data to understand why the data looks and functions the way it does. Um, so it's exactly what Javier was saying, just going one step further and saying, instead of it being an open text box, maybe it's always an open text box, but is there a better way to do it? Is there a parameterized way to do this? Um, is that metadata being captured in a way that's structured, in a way that's comparable to other data sets, for example? Great. Okay, um, I'm conscious of the time that we have left, but I want to uh, raise a couple of questions um, still coming from the audience. One is um, when you are thinking about, you know, building on top of what you have uh, put forth as a framework, um, uh, what, how can, um, you know, different data owners, different um, uh, contributors, um, use and build uh, on top of this framework? What are the different um, you know, use cases 
this, uh, uh, this framework can be applied to, if you could uh, shed some light on that. to ask a clarifying question are we referring to the framework of uh what was developed in this engagement or the framework of the that the data nutrition project uses for label development generally i believe the question is uh, the general uh project work ah okay um i uh i can start and yeah newman and kasha please please jump in um so yeah, one of the things that we have in our current version of the label maker and the label itself is a lot of the questions like we have designed to be domain agnostic. So when we ask different questions around the process of data collection, how you define, what are some of the social contexts that are really important to understand? What is some of the expertise that someone would need in a given domain in order to really understand like the data definition and the column definition or the various feature definition that you have in your data set. Um, and as we have engaged with uh, data set owners and data set creators in different domains, we have found uh, through clarifying and feedback with them that there are ways to ask those questions uh, in a, that are specific to a given domain that really make the question more straightforward and then get to the heart of the issue for a specific domain. Uh, I'm trying to think of, of an example. Um, and one isn't coming to mind, but I know like, for instance, let's say that we were talking about healthcare in the US and we were talking about um, how uh, we were asking around the, the social context with, uh, with regards to a data set definition with healthcare in the US. We might wanna ask more specifically, uh, about the social context uh, sort of in the data definition process as it relates to some of the historical tendencies in the healthcare system in the US around which 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 sort of populations have um, sort of been centered in the in the healthcare system and which ones have not been. Um, and so one thing that we are hoping to do with now that we you know we we have this new version of the label that we released in April and we are hoping to kind of engage with a lot of different domains to understand what is a more specific way that we can ask a given question in that, that is currently domain agnostic that really gets to the heart of the issue within, say, humanitarian data or healthcare data or big tech data and things of that nature? Well, one th additional thing I would uh, add on that is, um, is that the knowledge that all the questions that Matt alluded to are available for download on the label maker site. So... I think there's a lot of different places that the sort of knowledge structure, what we've developed could be used in addition to just making a nutrition label for data sets. So you might use it in an educational context. You might use it to teach people about the kinds of questions they should be thinking about before they create a data set. Um, and then the label itself might just be a midpoint in a much bigger process. It's not the end point, it's just the midpoint because you wanna do something with that data. So um, yeah, I know we're getting close to the hour, but I. Um, just wanted to add those a couple things to what Matt already shared. Great. Um, just before we close, maybe the very final question and um, just one minute, uh, maybe 30 seconds for each. How do data quality standards and metrics factor into some of the larger discussions right now around responsible AI um, and risk mitigation of massive systems like large language models? I think this would be a useful uh, yeah, answer we would want to hear from you. I can try to do that in 30 seconds. Um, I mean, I think that right now, large language models, all the rage, like ChatGPT, DALI, these generative models, the way that they're approaching data is that they're chucking lots and lots of data into a machine and they're processing that and building the AI on top. There is a shift right now towards thinking about quality data rather than just a quantity of data, but the data sets are really massive. Um, Newman's already pointed out that our label is not best suited for massive, massive streaming data sets. And so that is one area that is a little bit challenging. You probably need to adapt what we currently have to think about massive data sets. Although to Matt's point, we're focused a lot on the context behind the actual data, the data collection process and these kinds of things. And those questions are still very much relevant in this context. I think the secondary uh, answer to that is that the way that these large language models are going to be used uh, is that people are building things on top. And when they build on top of a language model, they have to retrain that model on a smaller data set. 
And all of a sudden we're back in the world of small data, <laughs> relatively small data, right? Which is much more manageable and what our label has actually been built for. Um, so certainly documentation factors into all of these data sets, no matter what size. I think the label itself is more compatible with smaller data sets, but still I'd say maybe 50% of the questions are still very useful um, for very large data sets as well. And uh, Newman or Matt, if you want to add your 30 seconds. I guess I would just say that as more people are thinking about data, um, the more, um, you know, sort of it's just like the public conversation is changing with the large language models. Um, there's hopefully going to be increasing demand for data transparency and data quality. So um, while there's a lot of people that are misinformed and there's a lot of hype in the media and there's a lot of problems with like, fear mongering, et cetera, um, the benefit is that people are starting to pay attention and ask questions. And we do expect that this will create some demand on companies, on regulators, on others to disclose where the data is coming from, what anomalies might be in the data, what potential harms might come out of it, how might this model be biased in ways that are usually discriminatory, um, and what are we going to do about that? Yeah, and if I could just add um, a couple other things. Um, one way in which I find the, the large language model conversation particularly sort of tough with, the, with our label is that usually there are multiple rounds of fine tuning that use different data sets. And so putting a data label on a model that has multiple rounds like that can be challenging. The other thing that I find challenging is that I think that sometimes my definition of data quality and um, their definition, the people, this is the folks who create large language models definition of data quality is very different. Um, for instance, I was attending a, a webinar where someone who works with large language models referred to um, uh, a really, really quality data as um, like the highest quality data is when you can sort of get someone to type in a response to a large language model and then click whether whether thumbs up or thumbs down on whether the response they got was 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 acceptable or not acceptable. They referred to that as really high quality data. And I would say that I personally would not consider that the highest quality data. Uh, and so that is also a conversation that I think needs to happen within the large language model uh, domain as well. Great. Really, really thank you all uh, for your um, insights. And this is a topic I'm sure we could talk about uh, for a very long time. And. I, we still have appetite uh, at the moment to delve in more, but we are restricted by the time we have. Um, so we have to really end here. Um, I'm sure you have upcoming um, projects and initiatives um, that you would like to share with the HDS community. So um, we will include that in the email communication that will be coming out after the, after the webinar. Um, so um, I think I'll just say thank you, really expressing our gratitude um, to our panelists today, Kasha, Matt, and Newman. Um, very valuable contributions uh, to the discussion. I also want to thank our audience for their engagement and questions. We hope this webinar has provided you with valuable knowledge and inspired further exploration. We will, uh, we, um, before we conclude, I encourage everyone to visit the HDX platform, which is https data.homdata.org, to explore the vast collection of data and resources. And so with that, we come to the end of today's webinar. We we'll look forward to meeting you again in our next HDX uh, dataset deep dive. Have a wonderful day. Bye, everyone. Thank you, colleagues. Bye-bye.